the this meeting is being recorded yes thank you athena good morning seeing the presence of a quorum quorum i'm going to call the gol committee together at 9 31 um, this morning and i'll just read uh pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 and 107 of the acts of 2022 this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. And um, no, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And I'm checking for, just wanna see who's here. Oh, Michelle's here. Yeah, great. No, I meant in terms of the public. Okay. Just one. Okay. The Amherst Indy, not a person, a thing. Um, so I'm going to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. So I'll call the roll. Um, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. And Pat, I just, I have to grab my charger. So I'm going to step away for a moment, but I'll be right back. Okay. Mandy Joe. Present. Uh, Jennifer. Present. And I am present, at least in spirit. Um, so there's there has been some confusion for me in terms of setting up the uh, agenda and getting things in the packet. So I will be working on that um, and start getting that done in a little bit better fashion. What I'd like to start with, what the first announcement I want to make is that uh, uh, Lauren Goldberg will be joining us next uh, at our next meeting on the 12th. And she can either be here at 9.30 or 10.30. So I wanted to get a sense of what would be the best time. Um, so do people have an opinion about that? And that is to, to look at the civility, the Supreme Judicial Court decision. Does anybody care whether we... I would go with 9.30. Okay. I'm sorry, what, Lynn? I said I would go with 9.30. Okay. Unless people are saying they can't be here. Uh, Michelle stepped away, so let's, let's wait here till we hear from her. Well, except we have a quorum and we can continue and she'll be right back. And there, nothing big is going to be happening. So um, I think I'd like to continue and we can look, move on to proclamations. And Bandy, do you want to start with the Children's Mental Health Proclamation? Um, yeah, the the only thing that's different is there's another counselor sponsor. Um, I sent the updated one to Athena and Pat. The only change was to add another name and make council and counselors plural. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, Dorothy Pam is sponsoring it with me. Yeah. So. And does, does any, did anyone else find anything in it? Okay, so uh, do I have to move individually on these proclamations, or should I just can I put them in the lump and say uh, and then move that we or that we're recommending them? What if we do as clear, consistent, and actionable? It's, it's less words if you do it separately. Oh, okay. My, my preference would be separate. Right. So, so Mandy, you want to make a motion on the uh, proclamation? Sure. Um, I move to declare the 2023 Children's Mental Health Awareness Day and Week Proclamation clear, consistent, and actionable. Thanks. Second. Second. <laughs> okay. okay. Let's move on to the. No, we have uh, to vote. We have to vote. Oh, Who was the second? Jennifer. Yeah. Second. Oh, yeah. or, no, Lynn. <laughs> it was either Jennifer or Lynn. Take yeah. your pick. <laughs> okay. Um, I did told you I didn't want to chair. Anyway, this is, <laughs> so uh, we'll do the voting. Lynn Griesmer? Yes. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Yes. And I'm an aye, Pat Tan. I'm, I'm also an aye, I'm here. I'm oh, great, thank you, okay. Michelle. I'm glad you're here. Uh, let's move on to the Asian Pacific Islander proclamation. And I believe that's still you, Mandy. Is that accurate? Yep, uh, I don't have much to say about it right now, but um, I did check with Jennifer about the timing of the, or the date of the event. Mm -hmm. So that is in there and 
is up to date the last time I heard from her. And then I'd like to declare the, unless there is any other comment, I'm going to declare the um, Asian Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Month proclamation clear, consistent, and actionable. Is there a second? Second. Okay. <laughs> okay and we'll begin the vote with uh, Mandy Joe. Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Lynn Griesmer? Aye. And I'm an aye. And now let's go to the Universal Free Lunch, which I think is a wonderful proclamation. Um, yes, although it's actually a resolution. I don't know. Re I'm sorry. And uh, one of the things, there's a few spacing issues on. Oh, no, it's been fixed. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Is it's there any question? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer, please. Yeah. Um, you can how introduce do we it. Want, do we want a resident sponsor or how would we? We don't have to have one. Right. And, you know, and we don't right now. So let's let it go. So in, then we would take that out. We wouldn't leave that blank. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. A uh, res uh, resolution, proclamation, whatever does not require a resident sponsor, but it does require a council sponsor. Were there any, now, uh, this resolution. So uh, are there any, Lynn? Lynn, you're There's muted. Format question. Should there be a comment after uh, Pam, Dorothy Pam's name in the council sponsor? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Mandy, uh, Lynn, your hand's still up. I'm sorry. No, take That's it okay. down. Mandy Jo? Um, just a couple of basic things. I think we normally put ands after all of the whereases except the last whereas clause. Yes. Um, it, it's just a typical convention. Um, and then there were two whereas clauses that also I thought should have commas. Um, the third from the bottom, the whereas students who participate in school meals a comma after vegetables. It's the, no, the third from the first page on the yep. bottom, sorry. Yep. The first, the end of the first line of that third from the bottom, the whereas students. Yes. And then the last whereas on that page. I'm sorry, what was of, the change in this one? The, the comma after vegetables. It's just another Oxford oh, comma. Thank you. And the same Oxford comma in the the last whereas on that page that has the states, California, Colorado, and Maine, the comma after Colorado. Oh, yeah. Anything else? Okay, one of the things I wanna to say to the sponsors is this should have been in a slightly better shape. Um, you, the spacing, et cetera, should have been done before it came to us, uh, but the changes are minor, so thank you. Um, uh, I would uh, like to declare that the universal free lunch resolution is clear, consistent, and actionable. Is there a second? Second. Lynn Griesmer is second. And we'll vote. Michelle? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Aye. Lynn Griesmer? Aye. And Mandy Jo? Aye. And Pat D'Angelo says an aye. Thank you. I think that's everything on resolutions and proclamations, if I'm correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and on the agenda, we have uh, just, just a quick discussion of the council retreat, how that was for people and any impact you see for GOL. Um, so if there are any comments or things that people would like to share. Jennifer? Um, well, I think one comment for, for GOL, I don't know if it was formally referred, was to address the abstentions. Right. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment? Yeah. Michelle? Oh, I really enjoyed it. And just once again, thanks to Athena and Pamela and everyone. It was really awesome. Um, and I learned a lot. Um, I did want to ask you, Lynn, if you if you see any benefit in GOL looking at that list that you put together and doing anything with it to sort of get it into a condition where we might have a time to look at it in terms of the priority list. It may not need. You but mean that these... Uh 
the criteria and then the priorities? That's yeah, the like we had the criteria and it was sort of coming from different places. And then you put together a, a really great priority list that came from all of the um, the chairs of our committees. And so is there anything that we need to do to kind of get that into a shape where we could then um, work with the council to make, you know, and it may, may not be, but I just, that's the only thing on my mind. Maggie, Jo has her hand up. Let's hear from her first. Yeah, I hesitate calling that list that was collected from chairs a priority list um, because it really just reflects anything that was ref referred to the chairs, um, which I think is different than the council having adopted actual mm -hmm. legislative priorities. So th that was my only comment. Yeah. There, so even further, let me just say <laughs> that list includes everything that I could identify before the meeting that still needs to get done in this term. So it's some of them aren't even referrals. They're just like, we have to do this. Okay. Um, so that's one list. But before we even get to that list, what might be useful for this group to do before we take this back to the council would be to wrestle with the criteria. And, and, and I think at this point, Athena, I need to get all of the stuff you have and all the stuff I have and see if I can put it into some reasonable shape. So if this committee could wrestle with the criteria, then bring the criteria for a discussion at the council and then um, also take the list of the very long list, if I will, and only highlight those areas that would be considered um, priorities. And, you know, in other words, if it's if it's something we have to do, like, for example, hold a forum on the um, master plan, that's a requirement of the charter. Don't we don't need to discuss that. OK, just to highlight the ones that are, in fact, the areas that have been referred to committees or we see it coming down the road. So um, why don't I try to do that? I'd like to say I can do that before the next GOL meeting. Sure, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to help with that, Lynn. If I could be helpful to you or Pat and just to get that together, I'm happy to That'd do that. That'd be great. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, anything else on any of this, Pat? I, I just want to also say I, I really just appreciate everything that Athena and Pamela did for mm -hmm. the retreat. Um, I. Um, you know, we, we always get caught between what can we do to make sure we just better understand each other versus getting things done. And so uh, I think some of that tension was there in this retreat, but I think the discussion we had on Saturday about rules was beneficial to an awful lot of the counselors, if not all. And I agree with Jennifer. The one thing that I think comes back to that committee is that issue of how to, at where, where we can, where we differ from something else. We look at the issue of what do abstention, how do abstentions get counted? Okay. And, and then the other thing is that I, I just want to tell you, I was not happy about Monday night's meeting because of the last hour or 45 minutes or whatever it was. And um, from everything I have been able to gather, we were not out of order to have a motion. And uh, I think that if anything, we, um, we learned that. And um, it was almost like having an extension of the rules uh, and practicing some of it, but I, I don't want to see it happen again. And we'll have to figure out how to uh, be less prone to that kind of error. Mandy? If that's the conclusion of the council, then I would request we look at, as part of the rules, the split that we have between what is called presentation and discussion and action, because the way I look at that and I've said this multiple times, not just last night, but in multiple meetings, when I see presentation discussion, I automatically believe 
basically there are no motions. We're here to discuss. We're not looking at things on a table. We're not going to make decisions. And so then when motions come up, not only am I surprised, I'm not prepared in some sense to make a motion. And so if, if the council believes that motions under those types of items are not out of order, and that, that's a council decision. I, I In some sense, I don't care. I'd rather almost remove that as an option on the agenda so that everything falls under quote action items so that every time someone looks at an agenda, they assume no matter what we're talking about, there might be a motion that could be substantive or not. So just another rules discussion on what our agendas look like, I would just request. Yeah, I, I would also agree with that. I think it would help clarify what happened Monday night. I, th I think um, we're going to be going into rules and discussion uh, some today. Um, so do people want to start there or in, in a more open discussion about presentation action discussion and what the rules are? Or should we go back to, we were going to bring up liaisons and we have quite a bit of going back to look at in terms of public comment, et cetera. Jennifer? Yeah, so I guess also in terms of rules and action, um, but maybe, uh, you know, Robert's rules or whatever can't be that flexible. So the action the other night was to ask that a committee um, consider something, which does seem substantively different than if we were voting on a zoning or I mean, even if it was rela related to the conversation, we weren't voting on an appropriation or something substance. It was just a referral in the subject matter. That was what we were discussing. So I don't know, maybe the rules can't distinguish between a substantive motion versus the, mo the kind of motion we were discussing. But, mm -hmm. but I guess that will be part of our conversation. And, and, and I don't, I'm trying to think. Pat, I think you were at GOL, I mean, at um, finance yesterday. Michelle, yes, I was in the you were too. Uh, it, things got even murkier. I was on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I zoomed in. Jennifer, yeah, okay. And we're in the process of consulting with legal counsel because Paul issues financial orders. And what we are trying to find out is can a financial order be amended or does he have to issue a new financial order? And um, if he has to issue a new financial order, that basically stands, Athena has her hand up because so maybe we've gotten some legal opinion back. Um, Athena, why don't you go ahead? Uh, Jennifer, did you want to get in before me? Well, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask. So if, um, and again, Athena may have new information, but what I was understanding yesterday that if we can't, make any changes at Monday's meeting, then there wouldn't even have been an opportunity then for someone to make a motion. So why don't we hear from Athena and yeah. then we'll talk about this. Cause it, it really, this all started to unfold in, an hour, in about two hours before finance yesterday. It was pretty messy. So the general laws don't allow the council to increase an appropriation when they're considering it. And I can send you the, the chapter and section. Um, we're expecting um, a memo from Lauren explaining all of that. <clears throat> and so we just met with her this morning. So I'm trying to digest that advice and, and pass it on to you at the same moment. But um, essentially what, um, what it means is that the council would act on the appropriation and borrowing order as it is because it can't vote to increase it itself, but that um, it can request an additional appropriation from the capital stabilization fund separately. And I think we're gonna try and get some language in addition to the motion or the um, memo from Lauren for the council to consider on Monday if it wants to do that all in one evening. But it would be because 
those appropriation orders originate with the town manager and then the council acts on them. The council can't propose its own appropriation to itself. Um, the additional funds from capital stabilization would need to come as a request from the council to the town manager to spend from the stabilization fund on that project. And, and then the council, the town manager would um, propose a new request a new appropriation of the council and then that process would begin again we'd need to post it on the bulletin board we need to re um, it would be automatically referred to finance committee they would need to make a recommendation we'd hold a public forum and so on um, and um, and that could happen in the future too outside of the meeting on Monday if there were additional funds that the um, town wanted to use for the debt exclusion to lower the amount that could happen in the future if it was from a um, if it was an appropriation outside the budget, then it would take the same process. The town manager would make an appropriation request to the council and, and it would act on it separately from the original appropriation. So at this point, um, the advice we're getting from our legal counsel is that the council cannot increase the appropriation by itself. Thank you, Athena. Jennifer and then Lynn. And then Michelle. Yeah, I guess I'm just going to say that's why I, I, which we did, you know, I, it, it didn't make sense to me that all this could wait until Monday for the motion to be made because that seemed, it just didn't seem to make sense timing that we could then change what was before us on Monday to vote on. So I, I guess, uh, you know, and it's just off the top of my head. I mean, I'm, I am, um, pleased that we got to refer the motion on Monday because it seemed like this past Monday, because it seemed like to do it all on Monday it was not, it didn't seem to make sense to do it then. And now it turns out legally we can't do it. So that's just my thinking off the top of my head. I'm just pleased that we were able, the motion was able to be made and go to finance committee for finance committee to discuss yesterday. Even if the discussion didn't go my way, the process played out. Yeah. Uh, Lynn and then Michelle. And um, so this is a question back to Athena. If a motion is made to appropriate additional money or to ask the town manager to prepare a financial order to appropriate additional money from any account, I don't care whether it's this or, you know, you know, mana fell from heaven and we got a huge amount of money. OK, um, what is the vote quantum required? for to make the motion to request that the town manager put together a financial order. And also then if it comes back to the council, because he did do it, what is the vote quantum to pass that? So um, a, a request to the town manager, I would consider a non-measure. So it would be a majority present and voting. And <clears throat> that would be the, the request to the town manager to present the council with an appropriation order for such and such. And then the appropriation order itself depends on, um, borrowing is always a two thirds vote of the council. So we need nine votes to borrow money. If it was um, from the a stabilization fund, then that's a two thirds vote um, or nine. I have to look again. <clears throat> if it was an, a, a, an appropriation from a different account, then there, would, there might be different voting requirements, but it would all be in accordance with state law. So, so it depends. The answer is it depends. <laughs> okay, thank you, Athena. Uh, Michelle. I'm gonna be very careful not to talk uh, specifically, I'm gonna try at least, um, but just so the question I have, and maybe it can't be answered in this context is, um, does the current appropriation order in this case include the 5K and or the 5 million um, that was re recommended by the finance committee? And just that's a process question because that was refer that was recommended out of finance. So that's the question. And then wondering about that process. Yeah, this has gotten a muddy in various ways. So finance committee made that recommendation before the town manager had submitted his appropriation request to the council. And the town manager took that 
recommendation as advisement and he included it on his original appropriation order. So that 5 million is in the original appropriation request. Now that we have an original appropriation request, the council um, can't increase it and a recommendation from the finance committee or anything like that, now that the appropriation request has been made, it, it couldn't be a recommendation to for the council to increase it. So um, I, I hope that clears it up, but, but it, it really depends on what the town manager, because those appropriations originate with the town manager, that's where an increase would need to come. And at this point, because the process has begun um, and the, for various reasons that Lauren will get into detail in her memo for the council on Monday. Um, the advice we're hearing is that we need to move forward on this appropriation request. And then, like I said, any additional fund uh, spending from the capital stabilization fund would come as a request from the town council to the town manager. Can I just follow up? Thank you, Athena. That's super helpful. Um, Lynn, do you, do you believe that there, if the council's will is to increase it more, do you believe there's enough time to do that before the May 2nd uh, vote of the town? Um, point of order. I don't see this as related to GOL at all. Um, yeah, so I'm I caution us. I agree. I caution mm -hmm. us about whether this is even on an agenda or whether it's even within our purview. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And uh, uh, yes, I agree. We'll have, a memo. I... we'll have a memo for the entire council, hopefully soon, and um, we'll be able to answer questions after that. Thank you, Athena. Uh, Lynn, you still have your hand up? So I think you want to speak? Mm -mm. No? I took it down. Okay. All right, since uh, we're moving off that topic for good reason, um, I'd like us to... Um, We have the, uh, what's coming up? I don't think we have any. Uh, I'm not completely sure where to go right now. Uh, I did want, we, I have been looking at the bylaws that have been referred and what we're carrying forward. Um, there is the snow and ice has been brought back onto the agenda, but the, on, the what was included in the packet was Alan Snow's, final, finally we got some information from the tree warden about what he thought should be in the bylaw. And I was wondering if I could have a volunteer to work with me and we can compile that uh, together, those changes and bring that to the next meeting so we could get it done. Jennifer, that'd be great. And I'll, I'll contact you and we'll set up a meeting time. I don't think it'll be complicated. Yeah, but no, that's fine. I'm, I'm, done. I'm vice chair. I should help. I mean, I want to help you, but yeah, <laughs> you, I should I'm, help you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to working with you, so that's fine. Um, uh, so, Athena I, has her I, hand up. Yes, she does. Thank you, Mandy. It sounds like you're making a subcommittee. Whoop! All right. Well, I am. I'm making a subcommittee. And do I have to make a to move to make that or? So if you're if you're making a subcommittee, we need to post those meetings. We need to take minutes. They need to comply with the open meeting law. Even if it's two, because we're a major, minority. Yes, because the, the committee is yeah. informally designated two members to do work on the committee's behalf. <laughs> so we'll be I, zooming publicly when we talk. <laughs> well, that's fine. But I just feel yeah, like all the no. stuff about how much work is that for you, Athena? We don't have work posting it and all that. So one of you can do work on the committee's behalf and check in with other members independently. Oh, uh, okay. Um, uh, and then, uh, and then present, do not reply all. And then present what you have prepared to the next committee meeting. But okay. if you decide to work as a team on something that's within the committee's no, purview. I will work alone, but I will be contacting, and I'm asking each member to look at the bylaws that have been referred and send me and only me, do not reply all, uh, the information you would like to share and I will gather that together. And then uh, we just need to make sure if you propose, if you prepare a new draft of that document before the next meeting, we just need to make sure we post it on the web before we post it for the committee. Yes, 
Could, yeah. could Pat say in her memo not to reply all, ask us, some of us, to do some work and get it back to her not replying all? That's all right, we'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Well, that, particularly that takes care of the uh, snow and eight, ice 3.40, but we also need to be looking over uh, the list of bylaws. Uh, and I started doing that this morning. Uh, so I would like every member of the committee to go through those and see what you feel like we can just let go of. And again, send that information to me and I'll pull the information together. Michelle? Um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone saw Tracy Zafian's email on the snow and ice bylaw and the memo that she put together. Yes, yeah, okay. thank Great. you. Yeah, she does excellent work. Jennifer? Yeah, I was actually just going to say the same thing. So she also raised some, um, so we can weigh in, like she asked, like, what is administrative and legislative? Because she had a lot of suggestions about who's responsible and how, so can we, how does that, because that seems to be now what uh, the, the a major issue is, is how do we enforce this? Right. And can we we can we say we think like DPW and the police should work together? It should be at one or the other, or do we meet with Paul? Or how does that? Because that's not really our jurisdiction. Right. Well, Paul has already said that he would like it to remain in the police department because that's how it's, and therefore they use the traffic wardens also to help with that. But Mandy, Joe, you have your hand yeah, up. Our our jurisdiction, since this is a bylaw, is to declare who can write the tickets. And that's what Paul was weighing in on. We've mm -hmm. we've eliminated criminal um, fines or mm -hmm. penalties. I, I don't know how it's defined. We eliminated that completely in the draft. And under the civil, we said, who enforces that? And so our jurisdiction is actually to determine who, as a legislature, we believe should enforce the bylaw. Um, you can pick one, you can pick four. You know, there's there's been, I think KP law has sometimes said, the more you pick the sketchier it gets on who actually has like right. like who's going to take main enforcement right and i think that was the point of paul's um yes, but, yeah. but we do get to decide as a legislature who we assign the enforcement to okay so that's the enforcement but so if somebody calls with a complaint about sidewalks to the police do the police communicate that the sidewalks need to be cleared to dpw that's yeah, how does it work? I mean, it seems to me that the uh, that um, the, what I understand, and I don't know how accurate this is because things get very fluid in this town, uh, is that the if you you contact the police and they go and speak to the people, and if it can't be done, uh, for that they give them some time to do it, and if it is not done, then they can be ticketed and fined. So. Does anybody have anything better than that to add? I think the concern that was being expressed though is somebody may receive a ticket for not clearing it, but if it's still not cleared, how yeah. does the clearing happen? It, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. And, but, well, it seems to me, oh God, I don't know. Where do you place responsibility for, yeah, I don't know. Any thoughts on that besides my lack of them? Athena, were you gonna say something? Um, <clears throat> right now, it's the homeowner's responsibility to clear their sidewalks outside their house. So in the past, what we've heard from the police department is that, you know, they, <clears throat> if there's a complaint, then they would go and do a kind of a friendly right. friendly knock first and if there's some issue that the homeowner's having that's preventing mm -hmm. them from doing that then they could help address it but it wouldn't be go and give them a ticket and then oh you know, too bad <clears throat> um, and if it was a town town owned uh sidewalk then that would be a dpw the other call. thing that i'm sorry sorry athena were you finished the other thing is Cress has been out, um, and so I have. I believe there's been communication from the police department to Cress 
about helping uh, homeowners who, for whatever reason, can't clear. Um, and I'll do a double check with Earl about that, but I believe that's been some of their responsibility. Anything else on this? Is Are there any attendees right now besides the Indy, Anita Saro? Uh, I'm, one of the things that um, the, we are not going to get to minutes today. Um, they were uh, the wrong minutes were pulled and put into the packet. So we'll be voting. Uh, we're not going to be doing minutes. So what I guess I'd like to, us to do is to uh, go over the uh, we go back to the rules of procedure. Um, and I, Michelle. Sorry to interrupt you, Pat. Um, no, no, please don't. Um, are we so on the flag policy is on our agenda and I I d didn't see it in the packets but I'm wondering is that something that we're um going to be doing today or are we putting that Well it off? is on the agenda and because it wasn't in the packet directly we did re we did receive it um I'm not sure can we go forward with it without it do you have a copy to pull up It's a beautiful policy it's well written and I, I was reading through San Jose's and um, it's very clear, um, but we can go to that. I'm pretty flexible with this agenda, I think. Um, oh, let me pull up the word version, sorry. Yep, yeah. you can go ahead and talk about it even though it wasn't in the packet. It's been in a council packet before, so. Yeah, and it was referred to us. So Michelle, would you like to start that now? If you have any comments. I, I mean, it's really up to you. I just, I know that we've been trying to work our way through the rules and I don't know if we have a timeline in which we have to have those, that rule review completed by, um, but. Yeah, there's, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. There's no, no deadline on that. And if I share my personal preference, I really would like to wait for that. Um, I think we have some repair to go back to in terms of public comment, uh, but I really would like us to, um, to wait on that, particularly after the civility, because we are going to have to spend time on that next at the next meeting. And um, I would, what I would request is that people again go through the rules as they've been updated uh, so far and see the places we were uh, that you still need to focus on. I'm in terms of liaison. I yeah, so we can stop there. Uh, and let's move to the flag policy. Are, are there any questions about the policy? Um, it was interesting for me to read uh, about governmental um, versus uh, individual uh, freedom of speech and stuff. So uh, we'll start with, that uh, looks like Mandy. Yeah, the only question you know that I had necessarily was in section three, item two. Mm -hmm. um, that talked about the town council shall consider the, the display only if a request is made by a member of the town council. Um, general requests shall not be actionable. I, our current practice uh, is that at least for those two flagpoles that we require that any flag raising on those flagpoles basically be um, done through a proclamation or a resolution that specifically says a flag will be hoisted. Um, and those proclamations or resolutions um, can come from a counselor or under our charter, you know, people can uh, request action of the council by various things. And so maybe some clarity as to, are we removing the ability of someone from the public through an initiative or a petition with 50 signatures to um, make a request for a flag raising number one that then the council would have to act on? Um, and do we want to, in this policy, indicate what what the request from a member of the council needs to look like. You know, I had thought about adding words like in the form of a resolution, proclamation, commemoration, or citation, you know, um, so that it's clear how you do it. Because otherwise, is it just a random motion at the council that says, I move to raise X flag on this date? You know, like how it, it, it might be nice to specify sort of the form of that request. 
Uh, Mandy, you don't think section one covers what you're saying about commemorative flags, et cetera? That they're connected to displayed in conjunction with official ceremony positions, uh, such as a formal vote proclamation resolution of the town council. Where, where do you see that? Section, in section three, number one, just above what you're looking at. No, but a commemorative or flag, that's just what a flag refers to. Governments recognized flags of the UN, flags of sister cities, flags of sports teams, and flags displayed in conjunction. With official so, money positions. Yeah, but so how would we, if someone wanted a, to display the Pats flag, could I just make a motion at a council meeting under business not anticipated, I move to display the Pats flag on July 2? You know, to pick a random date, right? Like as a sample motion. Or does that motion need to be in the form of a proclamation resolution too? I guess that's my question about item hmm. two. You know, or flag of the UN, as far as I know, none of us have ever acted. That's a select board policy that the council's never readopted, right? So. Except because we became, went from select board to council doesn't negate a decision made by the no, select board. I, I, I understand just, that. The yeah. MIA flag isn't, as far as I know, not listed, covered in section one. I'm not sure. Um, it is in, in several of the other policies. So that's. Yeah. So I guess I'm just asking for clarification on number two. Yes. How do you make the request to flag, to fly a flag of Canada or Japan? You know, um, like I, I just think two might be more clear if it's by a member of the town council through or in the form of X, Y, or Z. Yeah, yeah, and that might protect against someone saying, "Well, I should just be able to uh, say I want the Pat's flag up," and that's Pat DeAngelis's flag, not the Patriots. Um, Michelle and Lynn, and then Michelle. Thank um, you, Mandy. I want to support what Mandy Jo is requesting, and I hope that it would also then just say consistent with the charter somehow, because one the one question that I remember coming up during public comment was, can a member of the public make a request? And I, I think we want to be clear that they can, but there's a process. I also... The reason I want to see a little more here about the process is so that there's no question and that they're and not just all of a sudden um, surprise motions at meetings, which is part of what I think doesn't work for our council. Okay. I have a comment on that, but I'll wait, Michelle. Um, yeah, Lynn, could you expand or someone who knows expand on what is the public's process? If do, is it the same, like where they would get with a counselor and um, spot be a community sponsor, or what is the process if, if a request wanted to come from a member of the public? My understanding, and I'm looking to other people is that it, they would either come to a counselor and that often starts a proclamation, which often leads to a flag being raised. And then the other, there is a whole section of the charter about citizen petitions. Yeah. Okay. So one of those two ways. Um, and Mandy, do you envision if we were to have the form be a resolution or proclamation coming from a counselor, does it it's a lot of work to put together a proclamation or a resolution. So are you imagining something that would need to just be simple, just to sort of mark that, or is it just in the way that we might think about it as counselors? Mandy? Oh, may I, may I share my screen too? That would be great. Um, Oh, Athena, oh, you're going to have to unshare. I, I was just. Oh, you were pulling up what I was going to share. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the same thing. So this is what's on our webpage as GOL, um, an FAQ on resolutions, mm -hmm. resolutions, proclamations, citations, and it declares how you can get a proclamation before the council. Um, and the easiest way is to get a council to sponsor it, a counselor to sponsor it, or you do a group petition under the charter, um, or you do a resident petition under the charter. Um, 
and all. So, you know, that's how you do, we've we've put it on the web page. That's that's how you do that. Um, and so that that's why I think requiring for flag raising a resolution, proclamation, citation, or commemoration is the right way to go. Because mm -hmm. um, we've already got procedures for that. But also to your question, Michelle, if if raising a flag is deemed under this policy. Um, if we are saying this is the council's speech, I actually believe we should have some support for why we are raising the flag. So even if it's just I'm going to keep with the Pats flag, even if that proclamation says, whereas the Pats won the Super Bowl on X date with a, rec you know, a, a whatever, now therefore we raise the Pats flag on X date. Even if it's as simple as like two things to declare why we're doing that, I think, is vitally important. Uh, but that's my position. Lynn, and then I have a question. I, I'm just going to support what Mandy Jo is saying. I think we need a little more understanding, even if it's a half-page resolution, of why we're why we as a council should approve flying that flag. Yeah, and I agree with that as well. I I have a question. Um, if the charter says that 50 residents can come together and sign a petition to have some a flag flown or or whatever their request is, what happens if 50 people come together and they want a flag? Um, that, that they want a flag that I particularly find offensive for some reason that as a, a a lesbian woman, uh, it and it's anti-lesbian. Uh, how how do I deal with that? How does the council deal with that if fifty citizens? And this is a question that's not. So I, I'm. It's the first time I've thought about fifty people coming together could counterman the whole purpose of the flag policy, perhaps. Mandy and then Jennifer. Yeah. So, so I was wrong with the 50, it's 150, but that group petition it's that allows a hundred, it, it's, it's still a number that's easily gotten Not for me. someone right. who's dedicated, right? Um, that, that group petition requires action, but not passage, right? We just have so to it would act. be up to the council. So it would be say, up to the council gotcha. to say no, right? And that's the whole point of it being council speech, right? Mm -hmm. It's the, the whole purpose of this flag policy, I say, I, I see is the choice of its council speech or its government speech is to say, you know, you have to get the council, the elected body to agree to the speech. Um, and so if it was something as offensive as that, I, I would hope that that petition or that resolution yeah, I mean, request I it would extreme. not receive seven votes right yeah, you right. know um so, so we it, still have the protection of government speech by making the decision by voting in the yeah by okay. voting no yeah thank you jennifer or supporting it sort of voting, all yeah. right because i think when the uh, public comment was actually for a member of the public to be able to ask and not have to go through the council. And I think we discussed there that no, we would still need a council vote for just that reason. Are, do Are we ready to go back in and look at some of the language of the flag policy? And um, Mandy, you want to make a suggestion on an amendment for it? Um, or are you not? Uh, are you ready to do that for that particular section? Or yeah, section two under section three. Item I mean, two. my amendment would be by a member of the town council, comma in the form. What did I say for mine? In the form of a resolution, proclamation, commemoration, or citation. What that doesn't take care of is the question about our practice in who can propose resolutions, mm -hmm. proclamations, right? Right now, any counselor that sponsors one, it goes in front of the council for a vote. Um, but then there's also the charter stuff that Lynn had talked about, um, you know, by a member of the council, you could say, or in the form of, or in accordance with the charter or something. Um, mm -hmm. You could potentially add that somewhere in, yeah, something like that. <clears throat> 
because I'm not sure we could, I, I don't know whether we can restrict the charter right to group petition to not be able to group petition a specific item. That would be an answer for a question for KP law. Can we yeah. say this group petition right under the charter does not include resolutions? I yeah, I, I would be hesitant to even say that, but I don't know whether I, we're legally yeah. allowed to. Um, yeah, I don't support that. I feel like people need to be able to just, you know, I, the whole um, COVID thing came from a non-resident of Amherst who brought it to the town, and it was a it was a very important, pro, you know, proclamation and decision. Lynn. You're muted, Lynn. Uh, yeah, no, a couple things. Um, as I look at Mandy's changes, um, may be made by the member of a town council or in accordance with the charter by members of the public. And I would just say by charter section, whatever, by members of the public in the form of, re of a resolution proclamation. And then you've got the word resolution. I think you want something else there. You got resolution twice. It would be resolution, proclamation, commemoration, or citation. Yes, citation. That's, that's and the, and the group thinking. petition is Charter Section Eight Point Two B, which is the which is the petition that requires council action. A resident petition under Eight Point Two A doesn't require council action. So I think we could reference or in accordance with Charter Section Eight Point Two B. Yeah, Thank and then I delete the by a member of the public. Yeah, just in or in accordance with Charter Section Eight Point Two B. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I would suggest, and rather than vote on this today, that we ask the chair to um, work with Athena to forward this to Lauren, who's going to be with us next time anyway, and that we also invite um, Pamela, who actually authored this for Paul, uh, because I think she was expecting to be here for the discussion. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Anything else in this? Uh, just one thing, Pat. Yeah. Yeah, and I, don't have, I don't have language. It's just I'm bringing up what Andy brought up at the council meeting. He talked about section 3.1, um, what the definition of commemorative flag is, um, and to ensure that we are okay with that definition. I think he mentioned potentially that um, the Tibetan flag that is currently flying on the flagpole per our current flag policy and adoption of a proclamation or a resolution, I'm not sure whether that's a resolution, um, might not fall under this definition. And so he mm -hmm. asked GOL to take a close right. look at that definition is to that see if it's Go ahead, I'm what sorry. we want, to see if it's what we want. I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I'm curious about when it says flags of the United Nations. Uh, I, does that include any nation's flag that is a member of the United Nations? And then what is Tibet still a member of the United Nations? Um, the uh, exiled government of Tibet or nation of Tibet. Um, Michelle. I, it's not, it's not really about any changes, just to say that it's, it's interesting if we read the background in the memo um, that, and as I'm understanding it now, and maybe I'm behind the ball on this, but just that, uh, you know, without a policy, how much liability, and in this case, in the city of Boston, um, how they were, um, they were held liable. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just it just is a sort of deeper thinking for me about how the council might decide um, on particularly if a person from the public or people from the public were to bring forward something and um, yeah that's it yeah that's it could it. cost cost a lot <laughs> Lynn that's a good question and I think one for the next time we talk about this which would be at the next GOL meeting because. Um, I think we could get ourselves in some pretty deep water <laughs> over certain issues. The other thing is I could foresee that there are some um, 
flags of the United Nations, if they were individual country flags, I could see a couple of them being very controversial in Amherst. Um, so I, I question that piece of it, but you know, that's all part of democracy. We don't have a democracy in this country, but let's not go there. Um, <laughs> a commemorative flag refers to flags of governments recognized by the United States, flags of the United Nations, flags of sister cities, flags of local club, and flags displayed in conjunction with official ceremonial positions. So I'm, I guess I'm less. Um, so let me just point out, we recognize Russia as a nation. And yet right now, given the Ukrainian war, I think if we flew the flag of Russia, we'd have a protest on our hands. But there'd have to be a resolution, proclamation, or something right. that went along with that flag. So it wouldn't, and that would have to pass the council. So mm -hmm. I don't see that as problematic because, well, I don't know what the, the resolution might be, but you know, if it were, again, the council would vote and that would determine the speech. It's not that this allows in any way that I can see anything to go up on our flagpoles. That's exactly what it's trying to counter. Um, does that make sense, Lynn? Yeah, I, I hear that. I <laughs> just trying to think of every angle. No, I know, and I appreciate that. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, I was gonna say what you just said, Pat, in terms of like, you know, flags, but you, Pat, raised a good point. Is if a government is a government in Excellent. exile, yeah, would that, I mean, I guess I was initially reading this as this was like among the flags, but if it's literally saying it's restricted to that, like, I don't know if the flag of the Tibetan government that we is, yeah, so that, that would be my question. Somebody needs to consult Jim McGovern's yeah. legislation on this. Okay. I can do that. And I, if I could, I guess part of the conversation is it wouldn't, the Tibetan flag, or some other flags um, that, that that I can think of would not fall under flags of governments recognized by the United States. Mm. Um, it does not appear to fall under flags of the United Nations. I just looked up the member states, um, assuming that it's would be found under T, and I'm not totally sure it would be. Um, no, I, it would there's be. a lot of them, so it's hard to span scan quickly. Um, but would it fall under five? And I think that becomes the question. Um, does it, you know, does five basically give the council the leeway to declare anything? Mm an official ceremonial position, whether or not it's specifically excluded under one or two because it's a government in exile or, you know, like if it would fall under one or two because, but it doesn't because it is say a government in exile or, you know, things like that, can you still put it under five? And I guess that's, that's the question. What does five include? how expansive is number five? And that feels a little like a Lauren question as well. And I guess, similarly, sorry, um, no, when you look ahead. at numbers one, two, three, and four, right? And you read that in conjunction with what we just did with two or before it was done with two, before the recommended changes we just put into two, the in mm -hmm. accordance with the resolution or whatever. Because um, number five in section one of what a commemorative flag is sort of references that you need the commemoration or proclamation was the intention then of items one, two, three, and four to not need anything specific is, is a new question that just hit my head. Wait, such wait, that, go, go such ahead. that such that if we wanted to fly the Kanagasaki flag, our mm -hmm. sister city, was the intention of writing one and two the way they were before we amended number two, an intent to say, if a counselor requests the flying of the Kanagasaki flag, you don't need anything other than a vote. You don't need a 
ceremonial position because it is already declared a sister city, such that now if we want to fly the Kanagasaki flag, we, with the changes I proposed, would we now need a resolution or proclamation? So I guess that's that's a question into the mind of Pamela and KP Law, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, were they trying to basically say, if you were a commemorative flag under items one, two, three, or four, you shouldn't need a resolution or proclamation. Only if you're under number five should you read that need that resolution. Similar, I guess, to what then Michelle was asking earlier. So Pat, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm trying to parse I, out what Mandy's saying. Yeah, and I I think Mandy Joe has an excellent question, but this is where the council, as long as we are within the law, if we say you have to have a resolution, then you have to have a resolution. And to me, again, I if somebody just comes and says, "Gee, you know." I'd like to fly the Pat flag. Um, and I want to know why. And I want us to be able to say to the public, here's why. I mean, this is our flagpole and it's the public's flagpole. And I I don't think we should just be casual about that. But I also want to make sure that we're within the law. So does that go, how does that reflect on the simple version of a resolution that you posed before, which I thought was a good idea? you know, that there's a sort of a standard thing that gets voted on in council. It gives some reason. Why are we doing this now? Is it because, so, you know, this is the anniversary of the founding or the anniversary in the case of Tibet of the day that, um, the Dom, uprising, you know, related to the um, preservation of Tibet um, as an exile nation? I mean, what is it? I, I think I think we as a council need to understand why we're doing this because otherwise there's going to be lots of questions and one of the ways to understand why and the rationale is to put it together in a resolution or proclamation and that can be simple michelle i'm also thinking about oh sorry Uh, i'm also thinking about timing um would there ever be a case in which we would want to fly a flag that night or the next morning after something occurred and getting a resolution or a proclamation through the council would take more time. Um, would that ever be the case? Like where there would be a scenario where we really need to be in solidarity with something, you know, in um, at, on that day? Yeah. And how would that be handled by this policy? It's a really good question. I, I, I think part of that is if it's council speech, the council has to hold a meeting to take a vote. And so by definition, then by making flag flying government speech, you might not be able to do all of those emergency ones because you can't necessarily hold an emergency emergency meetings with less than 48 hours are really specific under the law so you need at least two days to call generally a meeting and my guess is for much of what you're referring to it wouldn't fall under the emergency meeting portion of the statute such that you'd need 48 hours and in that time you can create a one line proclamation but but it becomes it i think that's the downside of a choice of making it government speech exactly yeah it's an interesting phenomenon anything else uh, that's a really good question it's really left i'm i'm thinking 
the, the town manager decides if the flag is going to be, the United States flag is going to be lowered to half mast or the state does, you know, if we lo lost someone in town or, or whatever, that gets, that's sort of automatically and it's addressed in here. Is there a way to address um, a major crisis, something, some event that that happens that we want to have an immediate response to? Is there a way to write that and still protect, uh, in this instance, government speech? Or, you know, that's, I think that's a real question. Lynn? We're not going to resolve all of this. And no. I'm hoping that our minutes reflect these questions so they can be forwarded to uh, Pamela and Lauren in advance. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else on this? A really thoughtful work on this. Um, well, I will bring the, I will refer the questions to KP Law and to Pamela. Um, and so I guess I'm suggesting that we move on uh right now i and i guess one of the things that might be helpful because i will be contacting lauren is are there specific questions about the supreme judicial court decisions that we think would be helpful to have for her to have in advance mandy it's sadly not too specific, but it is based on that decision and the charter requirement that all multiple member bodies have public comment at their regular meetings. What is KP Law's recommendation for a public comment policy? It's not too specific, but <laughs> I, I kind of want to know what their recommendation is, given that we're required to have it. Um, I'm, hmm, I'm, can you get, can you dive into that a little bit more? I'm going to, I'm going to leave you alone for a minute and jump to Athena. Because um, Thanks for calling on me. One of the questions that I would ask is if the restrictions that the committee already, that committees and council already put on public comment, usually the chair will say on matters within the purview of the committee. And I would question whether we're even allowed to do that. Oh, interesting. Wow. That's a push that I didn't because I want to be able to talk about anything I want to talk about. And that, wow. Weird decision in some ways. And Go ahead, Jennifer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess just a little thing, you know, that this decision <clears throat> doesn't really, this is, the message is that we can't do much to restrict public comment. So I guess then the question is, is there, um, at what point is language being so offensive that we could, I guess that's my question, if someone were to make, you know, racist statements, is there any point at which we can intervene? Right. Lynn and then Michelle and then Mandy Cho. I think um, we should make sure that we identify, I believe it's in the section of the charter. Uh, no, the section of our rules of procedure, what we presently say about public comment uh, because I, I know in the past I've had to ask people not to applaud and the issue of, you know, multiple responses and the issue of signs and so forth. What our present rules of procedure, I think, are not consistent with this new ruling. No, they're not. That's, yeah. Right. So we bet we should make sure that that particular section of our rules gets forwarded to, um, I would include Pamela in this as well, 
because of her legal background and because of the human rights work that she does, but Lauren definitely because she's coming for this purpose. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Um, I would like to ask a question about Zoom bombing, so-called Zoom bombing, um, and um, how, so a public comment period is defined, right? And, and the chair announces that the period has started and that the period has ended. Is there anything that, any implications in this ruling with respect to shutting down a Zoom bombing that may happen outside of a publicly called comment period? Um, and is there a slippery slope there? You know, like if somebody comes in and is, it, we may consider them zoom bombing and they're saying things that are offensive. Um, what, and it looks like maybe Athena has an answer to that. I don't know. Let's go to Athena and then we'll come back to Mandy. Thank Mandy, you. If, if you already had an answer to that, I can happy oh, to okay. shut up. No, mine were extra questions. Uh, so Michelle, typically what we think of as zoom bombing is when it's a webinar, uh, not a webinar, a meeting, and everybody is allowed to just come in and then people can share their screen and unmute whenever they want. And in the case of um, the Northampton School Committee, somebody was allowed in that way and they were able to share uh, videos, um, inappropriate videos during the meeting. So the way we run our meetings, and we've talked about this before, is to do them as webinars, and that way the host can mute and unmute, and um, members of the public don't have screen sharing capabilities. And that's why um, my strong advice has always been that we keep that webinar format so that it's um, that we're, we're somewhat protected from that. I think the question that um, that it would be great to have some guidance from Lauren is if somebody were speaking during public comment, because that's the only time when members of the public are are called on and un, and allowed to unmute, uh, um, you know, is there anything that a member of the public could say that would allow the chair or the president to turn off their microphone or cut them off during a meeting? And in the in the case of Wayland, <clears throat> it sounded like that um, is pretty broad what they're allowed to say because there was some offensive stuff that they said in that situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and could I just follow up? Is that okay? Yes, go ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I I guess I was just thinking about it in terms of like in person. Um, you know, it is interesting that we can control through webinar when people can come in and out. Whereas if somebody shows up to an in person meeting in the town room. We can't say <laughs> you can come in now. <laughs> you know what I mean. Right. So it's it's just an interesting difference, and I'm surprised it hasn't been addressed, given that we've been doing these hybrid things for a while now. So my understanding, and um, great to have this conversation again with Lauren, but my understanding is it's during public comment that those rights are protected. It's not any time during the meeting you can be disruptive. So the chair or the president can ask a member, member of the public who's disrupting the meeting proceedings to stop. If they don't stop, then there are additional ways that the, the president or the chair can address that um, up to calling, oh, maybe a member of CRESS to come or the police department to come and um, try and help resolve the situation. So that would be outside of public comment. During public comment, different story. Mm -hmm. Mandy? Um, just a couple of questions. With Lynn's question about forwarding the current policy, we, we deal with public comment in two different sections of the rules. Yeah. Um, I think both section Article 5 yeah. and Article 6, so I would encourage forwarding both. Um, because one of my questions is, and, and Athena's gotten to this, but I'd love clarification from KP Law. Part of our civility code is not just civility during public comment, it's civility during the meeting in general. And so are we allowed to, if we invite a person of the public or a member of a committee in to be a panelist, say in a webinar format, do they have, are we allowed to restrict how they are civilly or is it only us council members that we're allowed to have a civil code for, or is it any sort of invitee 
into the action items of the meeting, say, um, to give, give an example. Um, you know, and so, you know, comments on the current policy and, and what we can have a civility code for versus what we can't. Yeah. And then a definition of peaceable. If KP law has figured out what the court may define as peaceable, <laughs> that would be lovely <laughs> since that's the word that this decision used as a way to restrict stuff, but they mm -hmm. did not define what they meant and certain, clearly certain words they did not deem, quote, as affecting peaceability. So, um. yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I felt in that rule, you know, it was clear to me that the select person had really been quite out of water. And yes, there was a pretty derogatory comment made. But at the same time, I feel like, um, the person who was most, this is my personal opinion, the person who was most out of order was the select board person. Um, anyway, anything else for KP Law and Pamela on this? Okay. So I am going to uh, take a minute and uh, if. Anita would like to, uh, and to call public comment here. And, and so Anita, if you would like to speak or whoever is representing the Indy wishes to speak during public comment, we can start that period now. Anita? Pat, before okay. um, before I, I, I allow Anita to unmute, we, we don't typically identify members of the public. I'm sorry, she's a friend. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, but would you, Unknown person, please state your name. <laughs> sure. And here comes Anita Saro, District 5. Um, <clears throat> I, I do appreciate the care, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, with which GO, GOL is paying attention to the wording and, and to the decision of Barron um, <clears throat> and the effect that it potentially has on. Um, public comment, I just ask that some, besides a legal review or in the context of a legal review, and I, I did practice law that involved policy for a number of years in a non-governmental setting, but that applied um, uh, regulations and laws. So I'm, I'm familiar with the balance that any kind of legislative or governing body has has to bring to <clears throat> how carefully you you have to parse what is allowable and and what isn't. I just think sometimes we get into a situation where first we become so fearful that we're not bringing common sense and knowing that there's no way to define so clearly that we are 100% uh, protected in going forward. <clears throat> I think Barron is a specific set of facts and the lawyers among us know that every case is fact specific. And I think it was particularly egregious and brought brought the SJC to a specific place. But in the course of the the um, the decision, there was some uh, interesting and I think instructive language about how one approaches this kind of discussion. And particularly whether uh, they talked about limiting to time, manner, and place. So that, uh, as someone said, you, you know, we're talking about during the comment period that is defined by the council. Um, as that civility belongs throughout, but but the implications are are really the most profound during that co public comment period, and and that the restrictions or the definition that we bring to things is really under that three prong test. Really talking about what are the compelling 
state interest? What is the compelling interest that is leading us to that rule? So, you know, yes, I, I think there might be some things that raise questions and might even be problematic in the current rules, um, you know, post Barron. Um, uh, but I, I would just urge you to proceed with caution and proceed with a sense of common sense uh, bringing to this and with the expectation that there will never be an ultimate definition that will serve all purposes. So thank you for all the time and effort that you put into these things. I really appreciate it. Um, but I, I you know, um, just keep doing what you're doing and, and knowing uh, that we rely on you, the public relies on you to make wise decisions on our behalf. So thank you. Anita, thank you very much. Right. And with that, um, I'm gonna close the public comment period for this meeting. And now I'd love some uh, help about where we should go next. Um, and I know I should have this all worked out, but that's not my style, I guess. We have about a half an hour. Um, and I, I guess, um, according to the agenda, the thing to go to would be to look at rules and procedures. Um, and are people ready to do that? in any way and what would the suggested pathway forward would that be? Is Mandy Jo out of the meeting? No, I'm you. here just dealing with stuff. I'm listening. Okay, sorry, sorry. I just didn't know. Yeah. yeah. Opinions? Uh, Pat, oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. <laughs> I'm um, much more casual. I'm I'm okay with people speaking out as long as we're not speaking over each other, which is my tendency. So, um, I would it would help me to just have a quick frame of reference of where we are with the rules. I missed at least one meeting, so um, we I know we're pausing for public the public comment section, but where are we? What else? We were going to be looking at liaisons and legislative. Uh, issues. Um, I don't have, I can go get my rules. Yeah. Athena, I'll come right back to you, Michelle. The, the council referred back to the committee that questions um, on around rule five, three. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Around the public comment. Yes. Public comment, but there were other things. 3.29, I think. And uh, or I'm sorry, I don't have my notes here. I apologize. Uh, five, and, yeah, uh, five, H one. And, yeah, basically, they referred back the whole kit and caboodle, right? Oh, so I think, yeah, so, um, and liaisons, Pat, is one of the uh, right liaisons still needs to be looked at and legislated, and, yeah, and all the changes from rule seven, eight, and nine, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So do we want to start? Um, I, I, I feel like I, the reason I want to hold the public um, comment issue, but perhaps not all of it, is because we're going to be dealing with that directly next week. Uh, Lynn? Yeah. I also had made the recommendation that we not bring back additional changes in, in piecemeal fashion right. to the council, but we kind of do a collective set. And then it may mean that we don't come back with this until the summer, just because it's going to take us that long, but um, that we do an addition, you know, we continue to go through things, work on different sections, and then take it all back to the council. Right. And I, I agree with that. I think that's, I think, uh, I think a mistake that we made was initially we had basically very minor things and we brought it right out instead of bringing it forward um, as quickly as we did. And certainly a mistake about putting a substantive issue or controversial issue um, in the consent agenda. So Jennifer? 
Yeah, no, I was going to say if we're going to, you know, there's the items that we're going to wait until we meet with KP Law. Um, and then just maybe right now, or, and we could list the other items and then just go through the list and decide what we want to take up. I mean, what comes to my, I'm interested in the conversation about liaisons, because I hadn't quite realized that they're not allowed to participate in public comment. But anyway, that's just, I think that's. Yeah, I'd like to get to liaisons too. Um, and it's very interesting because, um, so is that all right with folks? Yeah, okay. So uh, basically, I feel like the rules were carried over from the select board that the first council was, we debated it very carefully, we talked and we did as far as I understood at the time. Uh, we were actually physically in the room at that time and we were not allowed to sit at the table, et cetera. Um, and I think things have gotten very murky um, and I think that the way it's designed now is good. And, and I would like to see more, uh, more follow through on following the guidelines of it. But this is an open discussion. Mandy, I thought I saw your hand. No, I didn't realize you were specifically talking about the non-voting liaisons as rules carried over from the select board. So I thought you were talking about the rules in general, and I was going to oh, correct that. I'm so so sorry. That was, no, no, that was no. my own no, no. Mis <laughs> I, mis I information there. So that's yeah, why I no, unlawed my right. hand. I'm not stated in the clearest way. Lynn? Yeah, so let me share just some thoughts I've had on the liaison thing. Count, and, and I, I haven't come up with a proposal, but I, I just want to share some thoughts, okay? A counselor will often uh, volunteer to be a liaison to a committee because it's an issue or an area that they are most interested in. And this allows them to, you know, gives them an, an additional reason to kind of follow the issues. The thing that we ran into is and, and some of this is created by Zoom, but some of it's not, okay? Liaisons were never supposed to be at the table. Therefore, in a Zoom meeting, they aren't supposed to be on a panelist, okay? And they are there, the definition of liaison in in my mind, having had a liaison when I was chairing a committee when back in the select board days. Um, and it was most useful. I mean, they could help me and the committee understand process for how we were going to bring things forward. Um, Andy was my liaison for the fire and DPW study committee. And um, you know, in, at that point, we had steps where we had to go through the select board, and then we had to go to JCPC, and then we had to go to town meeting, and all of that had to get timed because town meeting only met twice a year. And so you started backing out and so forth and so on. So it does mean that liaisons either need to be pretty understanding of process of how to bring something up to the council. Or it means that they, you know, just basically say, you know, I'll get back to you and they check on that and so forth. Um, at the same time, staff people are in the room and they should have some of that knowledge as well. But the thing that's bugging me is we say to this one or two counselors who are liaisons, other counselors can come to this meeting and speak as residents. But, oh, by the way, you can't. And so it's created this artificial distinction between somebody who happens to be the liaison and the other counselors who might speak at a committee meeting. And so part of my thinking was that in either case, the counselor that is a liaison is in is not a panelist, but they could raise their hand and clarify initially, I'm speaking as a liaison or I'm speaking as a resident. Let me tell you the concern I have there though. And it becomes 
and a lot of this is also training the chair and the other members of the committee as to what is the role of a liaison. And it's also making sure chairs and other members of the committee understand that counselors as residents can come to committees and make public comment, but they don't have special privilege. They just have privilege as a resident. So I'm trying to resolve all of that. And I just wanted to lay that out because since this issue came up and it did come up over the planning board and it, it came up because we had liaison and members of the other members of the council, both speaking during public comment in a way that shared their thinking or their opinion, if you will. And that's what caused this item to kind of surface. So I wanted to just share all of that thinking that's been going through my head without a conclusion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it wasn't uh, just planning board. I mean, it came up on uh, several different committees. Uh, so anyway, Jennifer. Yeah, I, th I think that would help what Lynn said would to resolve a lot of the issue is if the liaison um, was in the audience and not a, a panelist. I mean, I had a situation the beginning of last year, the first time I went to a housing trust meeting, the chair at the time, you know, who I have enormous, you know, respect for, he, he said he, before the meeting, he wanted me to share my thoughts on things. And I said, I wasn't supposed to do that. Um, anyway, so yeah. So, so maybe some of it is also, um, you know, making sure chairs know what the role of the liaison is. But I think that if the if the chair if the liaison wasn't a panelist, then they wouldn't be able to be make any comments aside from public comments like everybody else, and then identify themselves as speaking as a resident. So I, I, I think that was um, that that some I think in some with some boards and committees, the liaison probably is just in the audience, and then others. It may be that the chairs feel they have to make them a panelist, but if it was clear they're not a panelist, although the chair could bring them in if the board or commission had a specific question, I, I think that then the ambiguity of whether you're speaking as a person or a liaison, you know, an individual liaison, that might resolve that. Mandy? I mean, it's it's tough, right? But, you know, some of my concerns um after observing a variety of meetings right this is not just about my observations of planning board meetings recently but of other meetings that have we've assigned liaisons to are that and, and maybe it's education of the chairs but but i don't think as counselors we should put that education on the chairs everyone's like well the chair should know better but the chair is not a counselor if we as a counselor are going to take on a liaison role we have to police ourselves and things I've seen recently are liaisons not ever identifying themselves as liaisons, yet speaking. I've seen liaisons raising their hand not during public comment and giving their opinion as part of the discussion of the board or committee that they are liaison to. And I think some of that is entirely inappropriate. We don't assign liaisons to be part of a different committee's discussion. You know, it says the liaisons are there to observe, share information, answer questions to the degree that they can, and make sure that the council is kept apprised of the work of the body. They're not there to put their opinion out there on items that are being discussed by the body. If the body has a question about council procedure, they're there to answer it, but they're not there to say, oh, well, well, this is the council's opinion or this is my opinion um at least that's my view i feel like some liaisons are seeing themselves as potentially sort of an extra member of the body and that's problematic um uh, you know and and i think we need to police our counselors on what their role is not tell chairs that they have to manage counselors and start managing extra people that they didn't sign on to manage, right? I think that puts an un, 
undue burden or an unfair burden on chairs to say, you know, we have counselors that are going to be liaisons. We have rules, but you have to enforce the rules. Like, <laughs> shouldn't our council and counselors enforce some of those rules? Um, you know, and so so I I struggle with even the need for liaisons, and and I say that because we've removed liaisons from some bodies and they have counselors that they go to and just ask questions and say, you know, when is this coming up or when is that, you know, and, and then, you know, so, so that's number one, but number two, what, you know, what is, the council's purpose of having a liaison. Um, and I think the rules that are here try to define the purpose of sharing of information, not being an extra member of the committee. Oh, the other thing I was gonna say is we've had liaisons that, that, that never mind. I'm, I'm losing my train, so I'll, I'll That's be okay. back. I'm gonna... Um go to Athena and then Michelle who hasn't spoken yet and then Jennifer. Um, I, you don't have to call on me first ever. Um, I just- I like to... doing that because it's always refreshing when you speak. Um, I, I just wanted to, to mention that if, if a counselor is speaking about their personal opinion during the meeting and that that could be considered a public comment if they're not speaking in their role as a liaison. And if they're called on outside of public comment and they give their personal opinions, then you're creating a special public comment period for just that one person. And if you're not allowing other members of the public to speak during that special public comment period, it's, I think that's very problematic in terms of the conversation that we just had earlier about Wayland. Um, if you're creating an opportunity for public comment at one point in the meeting, then it should be open to all members of the public during that point in the meeting. And, mm -hmm. and I've made that point during committee meetings too. If, if uh, the committee is calling on a counselor who's in the public to answer a question or, or um, express their opinion, then I, I usually try and say, um, you know, if if we're going to call this a special public comment period, then you need to open it to everybody who's there. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I would like to share a perspective um, that that I that sort of has been guiding some of my thinking about this. Um, and bear with me just for a second. So um, I, um, as Lynn wrote an email to let folks know that I attended this course, um, Jurassic Parliament, um, and it really opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And one being that the chair, and again, um, I'm going to make the connection here to the liaison, but the chair of um, a voluntary association, which is what we are, um, is not there to be our boss, like in a typical hierarchical uh, organization, they're there to be our leader and to make sure that we're following the rules. Um, and so uh, Anne, who runs that organization, recommends even, and I think Lynn does this really well, um, that the chair withhold uh, you know, their opinions generally, at least until the end, um, perhaps that the chair doesn't bring motions forward necessarily. Um, and so just sort of mapping that on here, a different perspective in the way we might want to think about this is yes, liaisons, um, they volunteer for a committee that they feel passionate about or that they are interested in. But perhaps a way to think about it is that the liaison may want to be less interested <laughs> or less passionate mm -hmm. about a particular um, uh, committee that they're assigning themselves to or volunteering themselves to. 
um, so that their role, it, it kind of solves two problems. One, it is it makes it more likely, I think, that they will be focused on procedurally helping um, the committee uh, to liaison with the town council and also allows um, them to be freed up to come and speak um, about their opinion during a public comment period um, without and, and making it more clean and pure. Um, and so I actually uh, sort of agree with the idea of I'm not really sure that liaisons are serving a purpose um, at this point. And so I'd like to expand on that, but just offering the perspective that you know, we end up chairing committees in some cases that we feel like that that's our body of work. And some of us do, you know, we we try to be still neutral. I mean, AHRA is a great example. I can speak for myself on that, right? Um, but again, just thinking about maybe um, uh, volunteering as a liaison um, to a committee that isn't something that is in our heart and soul so deeply. Thanks. Interesting. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Jennifer. And then um, I'm going to take a moment. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the role, I mean, to me, the role of a liaison, I think of it more as to bring in just, we get an update at the end of the council meeting and maybe, you know, it actually usually happens at a time when we're pretty exhausted at the end of a meeting. So I'm not even sure how much the information is being taken in that we're giving, but it's really just to let the council know what's going on in the different committees. And I always saw it as more as it was the liaison was the information going to the public body back to the council. And there's and then it's letting the chair of that board or commission have a point of contact on the council, although maybe they're, you know, that person is more likely to contact the council member they that's either their representative or that they know personally, but that, you know, so it, it's somebody that the um, the chair can, can contact, but it probably shouldn't be. And I think if the liaisons in the audience, it's maybe less likely that they're just gonna be brought into the conversation. Um, you know, I, I'm, it's very helpful what you just said, Athena, about it setting up a set different public comment, because I know, there were a couple of times last year where I was asked to speak and I always made it clear that wasn't my role and that anything I said was just my personal opinion. But now it actually gives a little more, you know, you can say I really can't comment because that, you know, so so you that 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 would actually be very improper, even as an individual. But again, I don't know that we have to have liaisons. I just thought I always saw it as a way that information was being brought back to the council, but we don't have enough council members to be a liaison to every board and commission. So it's still selective. Um, but I think uh, that it probably is confusing to the chairs, maybe less confusing if we're in the audience that, you know, what our role is and it gets murky. But I, I would be okay if we didn't have, and I think we're all so busy that to say you should be a liaison only to a board or commission that you're not really focused on that subject matter. I don't know how many volunteers realistically would have for that. Yeah, uh, Lynn, um, I'd like to speak after you. So if you can. Please go uh, ahead, Pat. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here and I think there's some good ideas uh, being presented. Uh, there is some, one of the things that I wanna share a little bit is my li being liaison on the Disability Access Advisory Committee. Um, because I really do see myself as a point of contact. I get asked questions during the meetings. Um, and I sometimes I have answers um, about procedure or whatever, or I take it back. I have been requested to uh, send a memo to the town manager for asking a question for the committee. So it, it isn't even just the town council that I'm uh, getting information to, but in this instance, the town manager um, I don't speak unless I'm spoken to. I am in the room. I do. I must admit, I like being able to see, but of course, I can when I'm not. Uh, when I'm just a, when I'm an attendee, when I'm in the audience, I can see the members of the committee. The other thing. So the other thing that Ali, I feel strongly that the liaison needs to think about the power dynamics and. 
there, our voices sometimes have a lot of power. And um, on many committees, like, like housing with John Hornick, particularly, he invited that input because he felt very grounded in what he was doing and he wasn't, but a, a often a chair of a committee will be new or they're more hesitant. And that can create an unbalance if I, as a counselor, am constantly saying, well, you know what I think about this street light and the signal thing that is happening. No, what what is what is the committee need me to do? And I, I do happen to care passionately about the issue, but I feel re restrained. Um, that's not always been true on some other committees, but it's, it's really made me think. And um, I think we do need liaisons um, as this point of contact. And I like the idea of um, not being in in the room or how how was it that it got listed um let me see i forget right now i'm sorry and i that's why i don't like to not be in the panel use my train of thought it shall so, sit where the public are seated right now pardon me shall sit where the public are seated sure, yeah yeah and that yeah and I think I think that can be protective uh, of the committee, um, and I think that's important. I'm going to let go because I lost my train of thought, which is why. I didn't. And so Lynn will get to you in the mind. It may bounce back and it may not, but really want people to think about the disparity in power and in roles. So, I think that's an excellent point, Pat. Um, one of the things that we might think about when we choose liaisons are choose it with the committees that are most active in bringing things to the council so that there's you know some because that's where understanding council process is useful but i also want to point that every committee has a staff person assigned to them and that person should really be doing some of this. And this brings me to a much larger issue that is really beyond the rules. And so I, I don't think I should get into it because it's not part of this discussion. I, I'll just mention it, but then leave it go. And that is that we really fall down on the job in um, educating chairs of committees about how to run meetings, how to post agendas, the fact that they have to have public comment, et cetera. And we really fall down on the job as a town, but that's not the council's problem. It is on this committee. <laughs> um, Mandy and then Michelle. Yeah, I I, I second Lynn's, Lynn's thing and, and what, what some of what Lynn just said, but also the, the idea of you know, if we're thinking about liaisons as a go between to get things to the council in the right way, I'm looking at the list of liaisons we have. And, and I think back to how many have actually reported to the council in the last year. Many of these committees, we've not even heard a liaison report in a year, um, or we've heard one in an entire year. Um, at that point, do we really need a liaison is a question. Um, but but I'll, I'll, I'll even bring, bring up planning board, but, but uh, you know, I'll talk about planning board separately, but recreation commission, they don't bring stuff to the council, really. That's a new, new I'm going to no, interrupt just a second. No. It's a new liaison and it's, we, they meet during town council meetings. Well, well, you but you don't have to go to the meetings. Yeah, to yeah, no. Liaison. So, so my point is, does the Recreation Commission ever bring something to the council? The Board of Health, they yes, they adopt regulations. They're a very important board, but they don't need council approval to adopt their regulations. So we don't actually see stuff from the Board of Health. Um, you know, when you look at the Housing Trust, in some sense, it's the same thing. They don't really bring stuff to the council. They have their own authority um, versus 
in some sense a difference and I'll, I'll say CSSJC has a charge that I think is includes the word advise the council. So maybe they need a liaison because of how their charge is written on advise the council. I think ECAC is the same way. They have part of their charges advise the council. Um, planning board, half of their charge never comes in front of the council, which is every site plan review permit application they request, the council has no say in. And so do they need a liaison for that part? The second part of their charge, advising the council on zoning changes, bylaw changes, requires actually the council to refer something to them and then them to under state law write a report. So do they need a liaison for something that the council will always be a part of anyway? Um, and so I, I urge us to think more about what committees truly need liaisons and what their purpose is. I, I could talk about TAC and DAAC. Much of their interaction with the council is through TSO. And that is working wonderfully from what I've heard. Um, we don't want to stop that interaction, but does it need to be a formal liaison? Just another way of thinking of things. Mm -hmm. Michelle? Um, I wanted to uh, come back to what Pat was talking about and really support um, what Pat said about power dynamics and specifically looking at E. Um, I think it can get really murky um, when those power dynamics exist and a counselor is offering anything. It can be something really, really minor. Um, it can be interpreted um, that it is coming from the council or on behalf of the council. And I think, so I'd really like to kind of look at that one a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that I'm a little bit concerned about actually is I, um, is that happening? Um, are liaisons reporting um, pending policy or budget budget recommendations to the full council in a timely manner, and is there even a a process for that really? Mm -hmm. um, so it shouldn't be there if it's not happening, or at least it needs to have a more uh, defined process. Thank you, Athena. Thanks. I, um, I think that did um, come up for ECAC. I'm not sure if Anna was still the liaison to ECAC when she it is. happened, yeah. but um, um, but she did report on the budget recommendations from ECAC to the council. Um, <clears throat> and then also what I heard was that um, it might be a good idea for us to offer training for chairs and staff liaisons for um, you know how to conduct their meetings similar to what we did for the council and how to understand the charter provisions that apply to boards and committees, how to understand their charge, um, including how to make recommendations to the town council and uh, or town manager depending on what's in their charge. So if that sounds like it would be helpful, that's something I can propose to the town manager and try and work on. I think that's a great idea. Anyone else? Well, it's 1123. Uh, um, I, I want to do something that I do in, a, in the mobile market meetings. I don't do, the facilitators do. But um, I'd like to hear from each of you about how you felt the meeting went today. Uh, uh, for you, know, for you uh, or how, how effective you thought the meeting was, et cetera. Lynn? Since I have a hard stop, I'm going to go first. Uh, Pat, I'm enjoying watching you grow as chair and encourage you to work with Athena so that you learn some more of the new technology about agenda stuff. And as for the conversation, I think it reflects some of the respect that we're trying to 
bring back to the council and our differing of opinions. So thanks everybody. Someone else? You want Lynn, why don't you pass it to someone else, which is how we do it in the mobile market? Jennifer. Yeah, I thought this was a really um, you know, maybe because we didn't have like a controversial <laughs> issue no. on the table, but I thought we had a good conversation. And Pat, I really appreciate that you keep the meeting in order, but you also just let us have a conversation. So I think um, I think you're a natural chair. Baloney. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Please pass. Thanks, Jen. Oh, um, Michelle. Yeah, I second that about Pat being a natural chair, particularly in the, um, in the aspects of the discussion. Um, so I really, I really appreciate that. Um, and I th think there were some controversial topics today, actually, I would disagree with do. Jennifer. <laughs> um, and I think that we did well uh, to discuss them. Ms. Mandy. Mandy. Oh, sorry, Michelle. Sorry. I mean, I agree with Michelle. I've always found this committee um, for some reason able to talk about some controversial or issues where there are major disagreements fairly respectfully. Um, I don't know how sometimes when we get to the council that doesn't always translate, um, but I've found that this committee and, and, and generally committees in general have always been able to have those difficult conversations slightly more respectfully than the council as a whole does. And I don't know, it, it's interesting to think about why that is, um, whether it's a smaller group, whether it's less people watching, I, who knows, but, but I always appreciate this committee and its ability to get to a compromise on stuff before it comes to the council. Yeah. Will you pass Mandy? Pat, you're the only one left. Pat. No, I'm not the only one left. See, that's something um, that the committee needs. Oh, well, to of, <laughs> of members. Um, I, I think it was members? a good meeting. I would like to feel less nervous whenever I do this. I feel like um, I don't. So that's something I'm working on. Um, but I would like to pass to Athena uh, and to get her response to the meeting and her participation in the meeting. I'm not a member. Um, but I appreciate you calling on me. I'm just um, happy to that the committee will tolerate my participation in the way that it has. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah, no, we need your um, knowledge and understanding of many issues. And so I feel like you're called on consistently. And in my world, that would make you part of the GOL family. So you will be called on on uh, as needed. Also, I think that that you you really show what a liaison can be doing in positive ways because that's what we do. We go to you as the link to uh, open meeting law, all uh, many of the issues, and we liked your personal opinion as well. So given that there is a hard stop for Lynn and for probably others, I'm going to suggest that we adjourn the meeting and I have at 1128. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And Thanks. Athena, could you stay on for just a second? Yeah, and I just oh, want to... Hang on just a second.